Okay, perfect. Here we go. Um, so today, today is the beginnings of what's called the first derivative test. So this is kind of like um, half to most of the first derivative test itself. And I, do, I don't think that I saw Khan Academy uses that terminology, but uh, on AP they do. So the first derivative test is just going to be basically all of this information we can find from the first derivative. And, uh, and before I begin this, I, I definitely want to clarify. So uh, I can't even remember who came to ask me a couple of questions during the, my office hours yesterday. Um, but so yesterday, all during the hour, we specifically talked about critical numbers. Apparently, Khan Academy was asking you questions about critical points. And they are sometimes different. Um, basically, the only, the main time that they are different is if you have an asymptote. Because an asymptote is known as a critical number, but there's no actual points on an asymptote. And so it, it can't be a critical point. Um, the rest of critical numbers are points because they're actually on the graph. And so in that case, then they're referred to as critical points. So that, that definitely is a, a distinction that you guys kind of need to know the difference of. And I, I have a handful of examples ready to go. Um, my guess is these examples are going to take us two class days to cover. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. But um, to me, it's really important that you see the different style of questions that you could get. Because there are some differences between them that would be difficult to pick up if you're just doing it on your own. So let's let's start talking about relative or local extrema. Um, the first thing is extrema is a singular word for maximum or minimum, or both. So if it asks you to find relative extrema, it's basically saying find if there are maximums or minimums and list all of them. Um, now, I haven't really talked about relative or local means. Um, I, I think most of you guys are comfortable enough understanding what a maximum and minimum are. Um, you know, maximum is just the highest value. Minimum is the lowest value. But when you have a graph that, you know, can go up or down multiple times, well, you're, you're quite possibly going to have multiple maximums. And so a, a local, let me, let me just write it down instead of trying to use my hands to sign it for you here. A relative max. Um, relative is going to be the more common term. Uh, there are other textbooks and there are other places that use the, the verbology it's probably not a real word, but I'm going to go with it. Uh, they use the verbology of, of local instead of relative. Um, so a relative max is found when your function changes from increasing to decreasing. So basically, any time your graph does this, that's going to be called a relative max. It doesn't matter if this is the highest point on the entire graph. So if this was the highest point on the entire function, then it's going to be called an absolute maximum, which we're going to do, I don't know, in a day or two. Okay. Um, but any time you basically have a hill, I mean, that's, that's my easy way to explain it, right? If your function changes from increasing to decreasing, it's going to be known as a relative max. And that can happen multiple times in a function. Okay? And then a relative min is any time your function changes from decreasing to increasing.
And um, I mean, my my phrasing is anytime you have the bottom of a valley, that's going to be a relative min. So if your function changes from decreasing to increasing. Any kind of questions on what's up there? Carson, is that you that always asks about my cat? Okay. I don't know if you guys can hear, but I can hear her snoring through my headphones. So she's definitely out today. Is anybody... I feel like I need to get you guys involved. You guys, you guys definitely want to, uh, you definitely want to stay asleep and, and reserved. Um, but we need to learn this information. Who should we go with? We should go with Anthony. Anthony feels like volunteering first. He's excited. He's ready for the day. That was the excitement I was looking for. Okay, Anthony, my question to you. Uh, given, given from the perspective of our math class, how would you explain increasing to somebody? I mean, like most people are going to say it's going upwards, right? But how do you explain to somebody using our kilk wording, um, I'm not sure how to describe this without just flat out giving it away. Do you know what I'm trying to ask? <laughs> yeah, you know what increasing means, right, right. Um, uh, how about that line that I just drew? Well, how would you describe the slope of that line? Oh, perfect. Okay, so now, if you had to describe to somebody in calculus terms an increasing line, what do all increasing lines mean? That's excellent. That was exactly what I was looking for. Very nice start to the day. All increasing lines have positive slopes. So if you ever see the word increasing in our class, increasing is a 100% code word for positive slopes. Um, Chidera, Anthony just did all of the work for you in giving away the key information. How would you describe decreasing to somebody? Oh, wait, wait. How did Anthony describe increasing? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, Chidera, you need to down a few more Mountain Dews. Maybe pop some, maybe pop some Smarty Candy Canes or something. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't be encouraging the use of sugar. I guess that's better than, like, Red Bull or something, huh? Uh, okay, so what Anthony told me is an increasing line is positive slopes. So how would you describe to somebody decreasing lines? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, now these are these are little details that may just seem stupid, right? Like they may even seem obvious now that we talked about it. I guarantee you you're gonna you're gonna see the word increasing, decreasing, and you're gonna forget how to find it. Um I don't know who else we should go with. Um Alexan? Let's go with you.
You ready? You're ready. You're there. If, <laughs> well, I hope you're there. Um, if I asks you to tell me how to figure out if y equals x squared is increasing or decreasing at x equals 2, how would you figure that out? Oh, actually, that's that's not a terrible idea, um, but some some equations are are like ridiculous to graph. So often often we don't even try to attempt anything with the graph because it's just so complicated. Uh, okay, so Anthony just told us that increasing lines have positive slopes, and Chidera just told us that decreasing lines have negative slopes. So if you want to find out, I don't remember what I told you. I think x equals two. How would you figure out if it's increasing or decreasing? If it deals with... Yes, how do you find that out? Yes, that's what I'm asking, how to find out. <laughs> how do you find the slope? <gasps> oh, okay. Um... Do you, want me to, do you want me to just call on somebody else? Okay. I was trying to think how to describe it to you without, like, just telling you the answer, but I, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, Jacob. Jacob, how do you find slope? Nice. Very nice. Okay, so the word slope in your brain should always mean derivative. Okay, let's go with that. This is 100% the first derivative test. So basically, I just we just went through all the steps involved. So let's put an example up here. Okay, now... I'm hoping you guys, I 100% I get it that it's super difficult to stay on task and focused with these virtual lessons. Um, I will tell you that that's actually the whole logic behind people requiring the cameras. It's, it's not actually to see if you're cheating while you're teaching something, right? It's because a big philosophy behind teaching a topic to somebody is keeping them engaged and involved. And so a lot of a lot of teachers require cameras on because they want interaction. And um, so I'm not requiring them just because to me it's just a tech issue. Like everybody's trying to use the internet at once. But it's also very diff difficult for me to uh, keep you involved and interactive you know, unless they call on you. So, you know, drink a V8, have some orange juice. I don't care what, you know, what you guys normally do for breakfast. You definitely want to get up and get your day going before we start here so that uh, so that it's easier for you to, to follow along. Okay, so here's our function. The question you would be asked find all relative extrema. All right. Um, Lauren, do you think you can guide me on anything? Like, that's very vague directions. What should we do? What should we do first? How about this? How about this? Perfect. Perfect answer. I was going to say, given that we are in calc, if you're not sure what to do, take the derivative. That's basically part of every problem we do. So that was a perfect answer. So even if you're not sure why you're doing it, do it. This is how you get partial credit. When you guys are doing tests and, you know, things like this, do anything you know how to do. 
So 3x squared minus 6x. Okay. Uh, Ariana, I'm going to give you an easy question if you took notes yesterday, a difficult question if you did not. How do we find critical numbers? Okay, so setting it equal to zero or undefined was critical numbers. So what you said is perfect. Good. Very good. So you are right. We are going to factor this one because it's factorable. Okay. And there are no undefineds because there's no denominator. So I'm going to take each factor and make it equal to zero. All right, I got two critical numbers. Now, if you guys remember me explaining critical numbers, critical numbers are where something happens in your graph, like where it changes from down to up, or where it changes from up to down, or it's a sharp point. It's where something happens. Well, conveniently, critical numbers are always in between. Let me back that up. Conveniently, critical numbers are where we find relative extrema because you're guaranteed that the top or bottoms are at critical numbers. So what we do is we make a number line. And from that number line, this problem did not give us any kind of boundary or interval. So we're going to start off by, you know, putting all the numbers. Um, wait, I got to scroll down. I got to scroll down. Who have I called on? Uh, I have not called on Sam. Sam, what numbers do you think I'm going to put on that number line? That was very good logic. Basically, the only two numbers we've even talked about. Okay, good. So I know that my graph changes at 0 and 2 because they're critical numbers. Sydney. How am I going to figure out the slopes in between 0 and 2? Any thoughts? And maybe Cindy's internet isn't working again, because I know the other day it was kind of going weird. Okay, Oscar, we'll go with you if yours is going well. Okay, do you have any... Oh, go ahead. Well, I said zero to two, but that I said zero to two, but that's all right. We can. Perfect. Because it's the easiest number possible. So we're going to use one. And we want to figure out if F prime of one is positive or negative. Um, so then I go to my derivative. 3 times 1 squared is 3, minus 6 times 1 is 6, it's, it's negative 3. So our test number gave us a negative slope. That means all of the slopes in the derivative in this section are negative. And we're going to do this for each section. Um, Marissa. Wait, I should have timed this way better. Marissa, I should call on you exactly at 9.30, because I want to hear the cuckoo clock again. Or did you want to go now? Okay. What number would you test from negative infinity to zero? What's an easy number? That's exactly what I would go with. So you guys could test any number in there. My obvious recommendation is to pick the easiest number that you could probably do in your head. 
So 3 times negative 1 squared is 3. And then it's actually going to be plus 6. So we get 9. And that means every slope in this section is positive. And then I don't even know if I need to explain it for the last section, but we're going to test a number in here. Um, I'm going to test 10, because 10 is often easy to calculate. I mean, 3 would have worked as well, though. Uh, so 10 would be 300 minus 60, which is positive. I don't even 240, I guess. I don't care what the actual number is. I just care if it's positive or negative. All right. Uh, AJ? Oh, go ahead. <gasps> ah, I don't plug them in because I already know their slope. Their slope is zero. Because we started off we started off by figuring out what x values have a slope of 0. So that's what a, a critical number is when you have a slope of 0 or undefined slope. So we don't we don't plug them in only because we know the answer, but I could write it above. I mean like that's not wrong. You could certainly do that if you want. Uh wait, who did I call that again? AJ? Okay. AJ, if I asked you to find a relative max by looking at these symbols, what would you say? Do you remember what I wrote for relative max just a couple lines above? Mm. And increasing was positive slopes. Decreasing was negative. Go ahead. There absolutely could. There could be as many as there is. No, you are thinking correct, but no. So a relative max is a single a single point. So what, what you described to me was my function is increasing from negative infinity to zero and from zero to infinity. So you listed the intervals of increasing. Um, x equals zero is going to be a relative max because it changes from increasing to decreasing. And if I want to know the point, I'm going to plug 0 into the original function, which would be 0 minus 0, which is 0. So 0, 0 is a relative max. It is also a critical point. So we knew it was a critical number because we found it first. But now we know it's a critical point. Mm, Chase? Chase, can you tell me what x equals 2 is? OK, how come? Perfect. That's a perfect way to describe it. And uh, the reason I'm having you guys describe it that way is because that's how you have to explain it on the AP test. They uh, they will not give you credit if you draw this little chart. And I don't know why, but they just don't. Okay, so that was, you know, that's a lot of information just from this one equation. Oh, you know what? I forgot to find the actual point. Uh, so if I plug 2 into the original equation, I get 8 minus 3 times 4 which be 8 minus 12, which is negative 4. How are we feeling on this one? I picked a relatively straightforward question. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. This 
this is what the graph looks like, if that helps. It was a cubic, so we could have actually kind of known the general shape anyway. Uh, but increasing from negative infinity up to, oh, that's a bad one, increasing from negative infinity up to x equals 0, decreasing from x equals 0 to x equals 2, increasing from x equals 2 to infinity. And then we have a relative max at 0, 0, a relative min at 2, negative 4. And that's what we just found without looking at the picture. How are we feeling about that? Um, what's easiest for me to ask? Should I put like a little poll to do fist to five? Or should I just have you, you know, raise your hand if it's going okay? Is the fist to five probably better because it's anonymous? Because I need to know how this is going for you before we move to harder ones, right? Like, it doesn't help anybody if I just go straight to a hard question and you understand zero of it. I appreciate your guys' input. Oh, somebody wrote something. No. Aiden, I have no idea what that means. Oh, okay. Okay. So, the biggest myth ever was that we were told kids would like to speak up a lot more when they're on the computers at home. <laughs> you guys are living proof of that. All right, well, I'm going to move on then. Um, but, like, I hope you guys understand that, like, there's nothing embarrassing about speaking up. Everybody in this class is, it's hard. It's a hard class. There's nothing wrong with speaking up and asking questions and things like that. So I don't know if you guys just aren't because you're uninterested or if you're tired or bored. Or maybe maybe you're pulling a Chidera and you just zoned out. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay, let's move on to another one. Um, I want you... Oh, that's not the pen I thought it was. Oh, well. It's going to be the same question as last time. Do you think you guys can start it? Using the other problem as an example. How about I give you, like, four minutes? Do you guys like the breakout groups, or is that stupid? Like, if I put you in groups of three, would you, like, work with each other on these? Or, okay. I mean, like, I don't know if you guys like it or not. It's super quick for me to do, but would you be more, um, okay. Would you guys be more willing to, to speak up? Oh, they don't? Are the other teachers having problems with them? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Basically, you guys are all waiting for somebody else to do the work or something? All right. All right. Uh, because, <laughs> like, if, if we we're in the classroom, uh, Kelk is actually really dependent on you kind of working with you know, one or two other people, because a lot of times if you might have, you know, there's little parts of a problem that are sticking points. And so between the group of you, you usually can figure things out. So um, why don't you guys just take three, four minutes, see what part of this question you can get done on your own. You're going to, you're going to copy the format of the one we just did. I can even scroll up so you can probably see both. Yeah, that'll work. Copy that same format.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Conveniently, why I chose this question. I uh, the examples I have, I actually specifically picked because they all have something in them that is unique. So the very first question we did was a normal, boring one. Uh, all the rest of them that we're going to work on have something unique. And I, I graphed them all so we can look at the pictures too. So if you guys didn't hear your hint from AJ, there you go. Okay, so this should have been the beginnings of your problem. Oh. Um, what do you mean by three zeros? I, I get, oh, like, like you got Q, X cubed equals zero? Oh, okay. Oh, what I wrote up there worked? Okay. Or, like, figured it out. Okay. Oh, thank you, AJ. I just saw that now. Um, well, the, our first goal here to find out anything from the first derivative is usually to find critical numbers. So that's when the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. You're going to get really used to doing that. So that's why yesterday I told you it's kind of a big, big topic. Well, those numbers that you find are going to be kind of our focus points on figuring out slopes. So then you're going to have to test a number in each section. Um, sometimes it works great. Sometimes it doesn't. Between 0 and 1, doesn't. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you probably tested 1 half because that was the easiest one to test. So f prime of 1 half... Uh, negative f prime of 2 still big positive I'm not going to figure them out I know what the graph looks like so I'm cheating a little bit f prime of negative 1 that's the first one in the section easy number f prime of negative 1 would be negative 12 pull no negative 12 minus 12 which would also be negative. So you'll notice I'm not even writing an actual number there because I don't care about the number. I only care about the entire section. And so if one number is a negative slope, the whole section has a negative slope. So that's kind of why I'm focusing on that. So I've got negatives. Right here was a slope of zero. Right here is negative slopes again. 
right here is a slope of zero, and then I have positive slopes. And this was all information from f prime. <clears throat> and I'm labeling the side like that because uh, soon we're going to have the second derivative test, so we would write the info from second derivative. All right. Um, so this equation apparently goes down, flattens, down, flattens, up. Because that's what this graph tells me. Or that's what this first derivative test tells me. All right. Well, <clears throat> you can make a quick sketch of it if, if it helps you. Um, you absolutely, you know, whatever information helps you, you can do that. But, you know, technically we don't need it. I do know that at the critical numbers is where my possible relative maxes and mins are. I'll do one because that's the easiest one. X equals one. X equals one changes from decreasing to increasing. Well, decreasing to increasing, well, that's a, that's a relative minimum. That's at the bottom of valley. So I know that we have a relative minimum at the point one something. If I go back to the original function, three, one to the fourth minus four, one to the third would be negative one. So that is one extrema. It's a relative min. The other one is where I thought you might possibly run into issues. So at x equals zero, it goes from decreasing to decreasing. Well, that's nothing. That's not a minimum or a maximum. So we don't do anything with it. It technically is a critical point, and it's it's going to be the point zero, uh, go back to the original function, zero, zero. But it is not a minimum or maximum because it doesn't change increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So we only have one extrema. And I do have this graph as well. This was actually the same equation we used yesterday when we were doing examples for um, critical numbers. And that, that graph makes sense. It goes down, flattens, goes down, flattens, goes up. So to find actual points, uh, you have to put them in the original function. So f of 1 is going to be 3 times 1 to the 4th minus 4 times 1 cubed. Yeah, so the, the first derivative will always tell us slopes. But if we want actual points from the function, that goes to the f of x. All right, thoughts on this one? The critical what? So like the yellow one. Uh, so the actual, okay. So critical points come from critical numbers, and then you plug critical numbers into the original function. So if I plug a critical number into the original function, that would give me a critical point. And same with this one. If I plug a critical number into the original function and it's undefined or something, then it's not called a critical point. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, and my guess is if you're a little hesitant about it, um, it'll it'll definitely probably start making more sense as we do more of these, and it you know you just kind of realize where numbers are coming from. That's an, a, the huge downside of calc is that a lot of times it just takes time because you have to practice things, and that's why this rush schedule is so horrible for us. Some classes it doesn't matter that you can do some outside of class. Calc is usually pretty dependent on doing it together, like live. 
Okay, what time are we at? 9.43? What time do we get done? 10? Ah. Uh, crap. We can do a third one. We'll fit it in. I don't want you guys to... I like calling on you guys because it tells me how well you're doing on it, and um, for lack of a better phrase, kind of forces you to try to learn it because you answer questions on it. It's easy to just sit back and do nothing if you're off camera, off everything, right? Um, do you guys just want me to do the third question for you and explain it as I go to save time? I don't like that format, but... Just, just at least get an example up there, maybe. Or if we don't finish it, maybe we'll just finish it tomorrow. All right. I mean, like I said, worst case scenario, we can finish it tomorrow. Okay, so a worse looking equation. I actually kind of like the idea of us not finishing this, like just going as far as we get. Mackenzie, do you think you could, what I was hoping you could help me with is, do you remember how to find the derivative for something like this? Or, or, do, you, or do you want me to guide you through it a little bit? So like, okay, like a product rule. Oh, do you mean you brought up x, you brought up x to the negative 2 and then like multiplied it out? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a 2 on the bottom, but if you bring it up to the top, it would be x to the negative 2. Okay. Um, okay, so you could you could bring this up, and you could do product rule with this is f, this is g. You could you could actually multiply this out, distribute it, um, and then this would become x to the positive two plus x to the negative two, and then you could do power rule on both. So yes, you could do it that way. Okay. That way it would work. Um, I, oh, no, that's all right. Uh, what you said was perfect. I'm going to do the derivative a different way, and I'll show you why. So, if I do the derivative, I'm just I'm going to do quotient rule, because like when I look at this, I see a quotient, so I'll just do quotient rule. So quotient rule is g f prime. plus f, uh, not plus, minus f g prime all over g squared. If I simplify this, I get 4x to the fifth minus 2x to the fifth minus 2x. Who am I kidding? We are not finishing this one today. Okay, this simplifies a little bit more because I can factor out a 2x. And then an x can cancel. Okay, you know what, Mackenzie, your way was much faster. So if we had done it Mackenzie's way, then the derivative would be 2x plus negative 2x to the negative 3. The only difference between them is the one that I did, I traditionally will do this one because it's easier for me to solve like find answers, critical numbers. 
Doing it this way is perfectly correct and is definitely easier. The downside is that it is much harder to solve that. So it's kind of pick your poison is the right term for that, right? So you basically just have to choose what works easiest for you. If, um, if this isn't too bad for you to solve, well, that's definitely a better way. If you have a hard time solving equations, you're probably going to want to do the quotient rule just because it's already set up to solve. So quotient rule automatically makes well, a quotient. And the reason a quotient is um, helpful to us is because setting the top equal to zero gives us zeros. Setting the bottom equal to zero gives us undefined values. Uh, the two I'm going to ignore because that doesn't do anything at all. Okay, so I have one critical number. This is not a critical point, but it is a critical number. Who haven't I called on yet? Kennedy, did I call on you? Okay. Um, do you know why this is a critical number but not a critical point? Do you remember how I find critical points? Do you want me to scroll back up to the other problem? Okay. Critical numbers God dang it. Critical numbers come from the derivative. Critical points, critical points come from taking these answers and plugging them back into the original function. Why would this one not be a critical point? But it is a critical number. What what happen what happens if I take zero and put it back into the original function? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, zero over one is zero. I think that's what you're thinking of. So it's undefined. It's undefined. Yeah. So that's the sole reason it's not a critical point, because it's not an actual point. Like if I'm looking at the original function, x equals zero is a vertical asymptote. So there can't be any points on it. No, you, that was very good. I mean, I, I was trying to lead lead you, but I um, it was it's very difficult for me to ask some questions without just giving away answers. So that was very good. Um, I'll show you the mistake I normally will see a lot of people make. A lot of people will add one to both sides and get plus and minus one. And if I'm not kidding myself, a lot of people will just answer one. That's actually wrong. Does anybody know why that's wrong? How many answers should there be from an x to the fourth equation? Four. If we have an x squared equation, plus or minus one works because it's two answers. Uh, but when you have an x to the fourth, there has to be four answers. And it's possible some are imaginary, but there has to be four. So I'm actually going to factor this into x squared plus one, x squared minus one. It's like its own little mini problem. And then I would subtract one, add one. Hopefully these aren't way too tiny for you. So I've got some more critical numbers. And these are technically critical numbers, but we're not going to use them. Cameron, why are we not going to use them? Oh.
Uh, I don't remember what I asked. Uh, oh, uh, I asked you why these two answers aren't going to be helpful. These are, no, definitely not. Um, why is the I going to be not very useful? Nice. Yep. So they are critical numbers, but they're useless to us. So we don't even use them. Imaginary numbers, useless. Unless we're an uh, electrical engineer, and then, we can, then imaginary numbers are actually pretty useful. Uh, okay, so Aiden, I was trying to read your question here. Um, I'm assuming it says when doing the quotient rule. Oh, okay. You sure? Okay. Correct. Uh, it's because it's really easy to skip uh, undefined values if you're not having a quotient. And I am 100% being blinded right now. I can barely see my screen. Should we? We should probably stop here because there's no way we're going to finish the problem from this point on. So I think a great spot would be tomorrow for us to continue from here. Oh, you know what I can do? Good God. Uh, critical number, not a critical point. These are critical numbers, but we do have two critical points from it. Because they're actual points. And at positive one, if I plug it in the original function, I'd have 1 plus 1 divided by 1, so 2. And if I plug negative 1 into the original function, oh, it's still 2. They're even powers. So these are critical points, and it's possible we're going to have maxes and mins from them. These don't have critical points because they're not actually even numbers. Okay. Um, again, just kind of ignore Schoology as to what it says, you know, you should do today. I was correcting tests yesterday, so I didn't even have a chance to go fix Schoology's layout. Um, I should be done with your test today. And then once I'm done with everybody's test, I don't know if I should just make up an answer key or, you know, what would work better. I don't think it would work well for us to do it during class, like to go over the test, because just not enough time. So I think I'll make up an answer key and post that. And I don't know, maybe a video, maybe a video of me going over the problems. I, I thought that might work okay to save time. Um, I definitely have had been people asking me about retakes. I mean, like, the whole, the test is all going to go in as one, right? I broke it apart so that you could see where things, where you got points off. But the thing goes in as one whole test of 30 points. So wait until you find out about that whole 30 points before you even worry about retakes. I know it's stressful. I get it. I'm trying to work quick because I know you want to find out. Um, but, I, I mean, like... Try to keep your focus on this current chapter rather than worrying about a retake or something like that. Um, I know it's a, third, a third of the you guys haven't even started the homework yet. And that's going to backfire on you. Badly. Uh, I, I mean, I, I I get it from one hand. You know, that school is just a lot of work this year because of the way it's set up. On the other hand, <clears throat> you only have three hours of school a day compared to seven and a half, whatever it was last year. I guess it wasn't seven and a half. You guys had, what, six and a half, maybe? Um, you definitely have time for it. So if, if you're the person that's basically waiting until the end of the chapter every time to do it, you're kind of procrastination in this class is really not good. It's really bad for you. All right. Um, I will see you guys tomorrow. Just 